Okay. Are you ready to dive into some serious brain-boosting science? Let's do it. Today, we're talking about pyrocetam. Ah, pyrocetam. This little drug has been making big waves for decades now. People claim it can sharpen your memory, boost your focus, and some even say it can help with serious neurological conditions. It's true. Pyrocetam has been around since the 70s, and it's generated a lot of buzz. And not just hype, either. What's really interesting is that the research suggests it might actually work on a deeper cellular level. Okay, so less about just feeling a bit sharper and more about actual changes happening in the brain. I'm intrigued. Where do we even start with unpacking all of this? Well, both of the research papers you sent over highlight something called the membrane hypothesis. They say that's key to understanding how pyrocetum actually works. Membrane hypothesis. Huh. That sounds a little dense, even for me. What's the need-to-know version? What are membranes, and why should I care about them? Think of cell membranes, like, mm -hmm. imagine the bouncers outside a busy nightclub. They're not just walls. They control what goes in and out. Keeping the riffraff out, letting the good times in. Exactly. And those bouncers play a vital role in how well that club functions. Now, imagine those bouncers getting stiff and inflexible. Oh, no. Long lines, communication breakdowns. Chaos. That's kind of what happens to our cell membranes as we age. Things get sluggish, communication breaks down, and that's where Pretrestum might step in, keeping those communication channels open and flowing smoothly. So instead of a nightclub, it's my brain that slows down as those membranes stiffen. I'm picturing Paracetam as this bouncer wrangler, making sure everything stays lively. What's really amazing is you're saying this membrane action might be connected to some of the big guns, like Alzheimer's disease. Precisely. One of the studies in these papers found that paracetam counteracted the harmful effects of amyloid peptide on brain cell membranes. You know, that sticky stuff that forms those plaques in Alzheimer's. Right, right. So we're talking about a potential way to fight a devastating disease. And it all comes down to how this drug interacts with these tiny membranes. That's huge. But you mentioned paracetam has a whole bag of tricks. What else can it do? Well, it's true. Paracetam doesn't stop at membranes. It also influences essential neurotransmitters like glutamate and acetylcholine. Those are what, like the messengers that brain cells use to chat with each other. Exactly. And it even shows potential as a neuroprotector and anticonvulsant. In fact, one study found that pyrocetum actually boosted the number of connections in the brains of alcohol-treated rats. Hold on. Rewiring the brain after damage. That's incredible. And to think we're just getting started. Here's where I'm really surprised. The research suggests pyrocetum's talents don't stop at the brain. It also seems to be active in blood cells and vessels. Indeed. One of the papers highlights pyrocetum's potential for treating sickle cell anemia, a serious blood disorder. They even conducted studies with children, and the findings were quite promising. Wow, this is blowing my mind. It's like pyrocetam is a multitasker, tackling problems from multiple angles. We're talking brain cells, blood flow, maybe even helping with serious conditions like Alzheimer's and sickle cell anemia. It sounds almost too good to be true. Well, it's important to temper expectations and let the research guide us. While there's a lot of buzz around pyrocetam, we need to be critical and look at the evidence objectively. So how do we separate fact from fiction? Let's dive into the real-world evidence. You mentioned studies on pyrocetam for various conditions. What can you tell us about its actual effectiveness? We're talking about a range of conditions. Mm -hmm. Cognitive disorders, vertigo, a condition called cortical myoclonus, even dyslexia, and of course sickle cell anemia, as we just discussed. Okay, so a pretty diverse lineup. What were the results like? The research paints a mixed picture, some positive results, some limitations. It's not a magic bullet, that's for sure. I'm all about getting the full picture. What are some of the most compelling findings from these trials? Well, one study that caught my eye focused on age-related cognitive decline. They used something called the Clinical Global Impression of Change Scale, or CGIC, to see if the treatment actually made a noticeable difference in people's lives. Okay, and what did they find? Over 60% of the patients who received pyrocetum showed improvement on that CGIC scale compared to just 30% who received the placebo. Okay, now that sounds promising, but you mentioned limitations earlier. What do we need to be cautious about? One important caveat is that many of the studies on pyrocetum have been relatively small. We need larger, more rigorous clinical trials to confirm these benefits and understand its long-term effects. So promising start, but more research is needed. Makes sense. Are there any other areas where pyrocetum's effects really stand out? One area I find particularly interesting is pyrocetum's potential impact on platelet function. 
platelets, those tiny cells that help with blood clotting. What's the connection? Well, this is where it gets interesting. The research suggests that pyristum might actually inhibit platelet aggregation. Hold on. Are we saying parasitum could be a blood thinner, like aspirin? It's a great question. It's more nuanced than a simple yes or no. While both pyrocytum and aspirin can influence platelet aggregation, they seem to do so through different mechanisms. So not just a simple blood thinner, always more to the story. Why is this platelet connection so important? Well, think about conditions like heart attacks and strokes. Blood clots are a major concern, right? If pyrocytum can indeed modulate platelet aggregation, it could open up entirely new avenues for treatment. Now that's fascinating. We're potentially talking about a drug that could address cognitive issues and reduce the risk of cardiovascular problems. It's like a two-for-one deal. It's certainly an exciting possibility. But again, more research is needed to confirm these effects and determine the optimal dosages for different applications. I'm starting to sense a recurring theme here. Promising findings, but more research needed. Got it. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's hit pause and recap what we've learned so far. Sounds like a good plan. We've covered a lot of ground already. We started with that whole membrane hypothesis, right? Yes, which explains how pyrocytum might be keeping those brain cells flexible and those communication channels open. Right, right. And that this membrane mechanism could be key to understanding many of its potential benefits from enhancing cognitive function to protecting against neurodegenerative diseases. Exactly. And let's not forget its potential impact on blood vessels and blood cells. That adds a whole other layer of complexity. Absolutely. We talked about how pyrocetam might reduce how red blood cells stick to blood vessels, counteract those spasms, and improve that microcirculation. Right, right. And how that could be particularly relevant for treating sickle cell anemia. It's amazing how much ground this one drug seems to cover. It is quite remarkable. We also explored a range of clinical uses for pyrocetam, examining both the encouraging findings and the limitations of the existing research. We talked about those studies showing pyrocetam can potentially improve cognitive function in people experiencing age-related decline. But larger-scale trials are needed to solidify those findings. Yes, exactly. Oh, and then there's the whole platelet angle, which is a whole other rabbit hole. Indeed. We delved into the intriguing possibility that pyrocetam might have antiplatelet properties potentially offering benefits in conditions where blood clots pose a risk. We even compared and contrasted its potential mechanism of action with aspirin, highlighting that while both can influence platelet aggregation, their pathways might be very different. And of course, we underscored the need for more research to fully grasp this aspect of pyrocetum's effects as well. But one thing is for sure, this old drug, as one of our sources called it, definitely seems to have some new tricks up its sleeve. That's a great way to put it. It seems the more we learn about pyrocetum, the more we realize how much we still don't know. Okay, well, I'm ready to keep digging, are you? What else can you tell me about this fascinating drug? Well, one thing we haven't touched on yet is how pyrocetum is absorbed and processed by the body. Ah, the nitty-gritty details. I'm ready. Understanding this can shed light on things like dosage, potential side effects, even how it might interact with other medications. All right, let's talk pharmacokinetics. Walk me through it. What happens to pyrocetum once it enters the body? Well, for starters, pyrocetum is absorbed quite rapidly. After you take it orally, it reaches peak concentrations in your bloodstream in about 30 minutes on an empty stomach. Wow, that's fast. So you feel the effects pretty quickly. Not so fast. While it's absorbed quickly, its effects on cognition and other functions are usually subtle and gradual. It's not like caffeine, where you get an immediate jolt. Pyrocytum seems to work more subtly over time. So it's more of a long game than a quick fix. Something to keep in mind with all the instant brain power claims floating around out there. Exactly. And that's crucial to remember, especially since it's often marketed as this instant brain booster. Always good to separate the hype from reality. So, pyrocytum is absorbed quickly. What happens next? This is where it gets even more interesting. One of our sources mentions that no metabolites of pyrocytum have ever been discovered. Metabolites, give me a refresher on those again. Sure. When you take a drug, your body often breaks it down into smaller molecules. These are called metabolites, and they can have their own effects, sometimes even different from the original drug. So are you saying pyrocinum doesn't get broken down at all? That's pretty unusual, isn't it? It is unusual, but that seems to be the case with pyrocinicum. It's primarily excreted unchanged in your urine through your kidneys, essentially just filtered out of your bloodstream and set on its way. So pyrocinum takes a quick trip through the body does its thing, and then heads out. That's a great way to put it. Okay, that covers absorption and excretion. What about dosage? 
the research mentioned different dosages for different conditions, right? You're right. The therapeutic dose of pyrocetum can vary quite a bit depending on what's being treated. <laughs> for things like cognitive disorders and vertigo, it's usually around 2.4 to 4.8 grams daily taken orally. But for something like cortical myoclonus, the dose can be much higher, up to 24 grams daily. Wow, that's quite a range. It seems like finding the right dose for each condition and maybe even for each person is really important. Absolutely. And that's another area where further research is needed. We need to understand how different dosages of pyrocetum affect different people, different conditions over both the short and long term. Safety first. Now, speaking of dosage, it makes me wonder, what about side effects? Are there any risks associated with taking pyrocetum? That's a crucial question. I'm glad you brought it up. You know, one of the things that makes pyrocetum so interesting is its remarkably good safety profile, especially compared to other drugs that affect the central nervous system. Really? So it's generally considered safe? Based on the available data, yes. Yeah. One of the papers we reviewed cited a pooled analysis of over 90 double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Wow, that's a lot of studies. It is. And these studies involve thousands of patients. And you know what they found? Tell me more. The reported incidence of side effects with pyrocetam ham was incredibly low, less than 2% for things like hyperkinesia, weight gain, nervousness, drowsiness, depression, and fatigue. Wow, those are really low numbers, especially considering that even taking a sugar pill can sometimes cause side effects in some people. Exactly. It's important to note that while pyrocetam is generally well tolerated, it's not entirely without potential side effects. Some people might experience mild and transient issues, and there's always the possibility of individual sensitivities or allergic reactions. It's always best to talk to your doctor before starting any new supplement or medication, including pyrocetum. Always a good idea to get the green light from your doctor. So we've covered that pyrocetum is generally considered safe with a low incidence of side effects. But what about drug interactions? I know that can be a big deal with any medication. Does pyrocetum interact with anything? That's a great question, and one of the papers addresses it directly. It seems pyrocetam has very low potential for drug interactions. Oh, that's good to hear. Why is that? It's partly due to how pyrocetam is metabolized, or rather, not metabolized, as we discussed. It doesn't get broken down by the liver, and it's not bound to proteins in your blood. These factors significantly reduce the likelihood of it interfering with how other drugs are processed in your body. Okay, so that's good news for people who might be taking multiple medications, but are there any exceptions? Any drugs people should be particularly careful about mixing with pyrocetam? There's one interaction mentioned in the research we should discuss. It involves a drug called carbamazepine. Carbamazepine, that rings a bell, but I can't quite place it. It's an anticonvulsant medication often used to treat seizures. It appears paracetam might enhance carbamazepine's anticonvulsant effects. Enhance, so make it stronger. Exactly. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to be aware of if you're taking carbamazepine. It could mean your doctor needs to adjust your dosage to avoid potential side effects from having too much of the anticonvulsant effect. That makes sense. Finding that right balance is key. So no known negative interactions, but a potential positive interaction with carbamazepine that warrants careful monitoring. Got it. What else do we need to know about paracetam before we wrap up this part of our deep dive? Well, it's important to acknowledge that despite all the intriguing research on paracetam, some questions remain unanswered. Further investigation is needed in certain areas. Okay, I'm all ears. What are some of the big remaining mysteries surrounding paracetam? One of the biggest is fully understanding precisely how it works on a molecular level. Mm. We've discussed the membrane hypothesis. Right, paracetone's potential to make those cell membranes more fluid. Exactly. And while it offers a compelling explanation for some of its effects, it might not be the whole story. We still don't fully grasp all the intricate ways paracetam interacts with brain cells, blood vessels, and other bodily systems. So we've got the what, we see that pyrocetam seems to have these interesting effects, but we're still working on the how. Precisely. And that's part of what makes this drug so fascinating. It's the puzzle that scientists are still piecing together, and each new discovery unlocks even more avenues for exploration. I love a good scientific mystery. What other unanswered questions about pyrocetam come to mind? Another area needing more research is understanding its long-term effects. Most studies have been relatively short-term, lasting weeks or months. We need more data on how pyrocetam affects people over years of use, both in terms of potential benefits and any possible long-term risks. Longitudinal studies are crucial, for sure. Mm. Okay, so we've got that mystery of the exact mechanisms of action and the need for more long-term data. 
Anything else to add to the list of Pyrocetam enigmas? Another question is whether Pyrocetam's effects might differ depending on the individual. Could someone's genetics, age, lifestyle, or even diet influence how well it works or how someone responds? That's a great point. It seems like with so many drugs, what works for one person might not work the same way for another. It would be fascinating to see research exploring those individual variations in response to piracy death. I agree. That's where the field of personalized medicine is headed. We're moving away from that one-size-fits-all approach towards more targeted treatments based on individual needs and characteristics. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, we've got some fascinating leads to follow, but... We're reaching the end of our time for this part of our deep dive on pyrocetam. I agree. What are your final thoughts on what we've uncovered so far? Well, I think pyrocetam is a, a truly unique drug, one that challenges our conventional understanding of how medications can impact the brain and the body. It's not a cure-all, and more research is undoubtedly needed, but I believe its potential is vast. It's definitely worth further exploration. I couldn't agree more. It's been incredible unpacking the science and the hype surrounding pyrocetam. But before we move on to part two, where should our listeners go if they want to learn more about this fascinating atropic? I always encourage people to do their own research from credible sources and to consult with qualified healthcare professionals. The world of nootropics can be a bit of a wild west with misinformation and unsubstantiated claims floating around. Approach it with a healthy dose of skepticism and a commitment to reliable information. Sound advice. We'll be diving into even more about paracetam in part two right after this. You know, it's fascinating how we often get so caught up in the allure of new drugs. Right. Like the newest thing must be the best thing. Exactly. We think they hold all the excitement, but then we have something like paracetam. This blast from the past with all this potential. It reminds us that sometimes those groundbreaking discoveries, well, they come from revisiting what we already know. It's like that saying, the best inventions are the ones we haven't thought of yet. Maybe the next big breakthrough isn't about creating something new, but about truly understanding the full potential of what we already have. Absolutely. And with pyrocetum, a drug with such a well-established safety record, decades of research behind it. Right. It's not like we're starting from scratch. Exactly. We have a unique opportunity here. We can delve deeper, explore new applications, ask those more sophisticated questions. It's like we're finally catching up to what this molecule might be capable of. It's like we're giving this old dog a whole new set of tricks to learn. Speaking of which, the research mentioned that pyrocetam was actually the first of the so-called nootropic drugs. What exactly does that term even mean? And what are some other examples of nootropics? Well, the term nootropic was actually coined specifically to describe pyrocetam's effects. Oh, wow. Really? I had no idea. Yeah. It comes from Greek words meaning mind and to bend or turn, essentially, something that acts on the mind. Okay, so we're talking about... Nootropics are generally considered to be substances that enhance cognitive function. Okay, so like brain boosters. Exactly. Particularly things like memory, creativity, motivation, attention. Yeah, those all sound pretty good to me. Right. Think of them as tools that help your brain perform at its best. Tools for the mind. It makes you wonder how much we can really optimize our brain power. So... Besides pyrocetam, what other substances fall under this nootropic umbrella? Oh, it's a big umbrella. The world of nootropics is surprisingly vast. It's always evolving. Oh, I bet. It's everything from pharmaceuticals and supplements to certain foods and beverages. Oh, really? Foods and beverages, too. That's so interesting. Yeah. Some well-known examples, race tams like aniracetam and oxyracetam. Okay, those are tongue twisters. Right. And these are actually derived from pyrocetam. Oh, interesting. So like pyrocetam's cousins. Exactly. There's also choline, an essential nutrient, super important for memory and learning. Hmm. And then we have stimulants, like your caffeine. Ah, yes, caffeine, my best friend. Right. And then things like modafinil, which some people use off-label for their cognitive enhancing effects. So we've got quite a mix of substances in this nootrotropic category. Some sound familiar, others not so much. But with so many options out there, what makes pyrocetam stand out? What makes it unique compared to those other nootropics we've talked about? That's a great question. One of pyrocetam's most intriguing aspects is its unique mechanism of action. Right. Which we still don't totally understand. Exactly. Which we're still unraveling. But it might involve influencing that membrane fluidity, right? Uh, that whole bouncer in the brain concept you talked about. Exactly. And it seems like that's one of pyrocetam's most defining characteristics. While other nootropics might share some similar effects, pyrocetam seems to stand out 
in its ability to actually influence those cellular membranes. So powerful, just working on the cells themselves. Right. And this could potentially explain its wide range of effects, from boosting cognitive function to actually protecting brain cells, and even those effects on blood cells and vessels we talked about. So instead of just targeting one specific thing, paracetam might be working on a more like fundamental level, you know, yeah. like influencing the very foundation of our cells. That's pretty amazing. It is. And it highlights another really important point about paracetam, its safety profile. Right. Which is super important, especially when we're talking about messing with the brain. Absolutely. As we've discussed, the reported incidence of side effects, incredibly low, especially compared to other drugs that affect the central nervous system. It's really remarkable how safe it seems to be, you're right, especially for a drug that seems to do so much. It makes you wonder, what's the catch? Well, you're right to be cautious. It's not a miracle drug. It has its limitations. Of course, of course. So for those of us who are now super intrigued and want to try Pyrocetam, what are some things to keep in mind? What are some limitations to be aware of? Well, I think one of the most important things to remember is that Pyrocetam, it isn't a quick fix. You know, unlike those stimulants, which often produce those immediate effects. Right. Like that jolt of energy from caffeine. Exactly. Pyrocetam's benefits they tend to emerge a bit more gradually. So you have to be patient. Exactly. Over time with consistent use. So it's more of a slow and steady approach, like building a strong foundation over time. Exactly. And I think that's really important to go into it with, you know, realistic expectations. Be patient with the process. It might take weeks or even months of consistent use to really experience the full effects. Patience is key, for sure, especially when we're talking about something as complex as improving brain power. What other caveats or considerations do people need to be aware of? Well, another important point is that pyrocetam's effects, they can differ from person to person. Oh, right. Just like with anything else, right? Exactly. Just like with any drug or supplement, mm -hmm. there's a chance someone might not respond to pyrocetam in the way they're hoping. So individual responses can vary. Makes sense. Are there any other, I guess, red flags or things that people should really watch out for? Yeah, and I think it's also crucial to remember that pyrocetam, while generally considered safe, it isn't for everyone. Okay, good point. It's not a free-for-all. Are there specific groups of people who should steer clear of paracetam or at least tread very carefully? Yes, definitely. The research mentions a few contraindications and precautions. For example, because pyrocetam is cleared by the kidneys, individuals with kidney problems. Right, that makes sense. They might need to adjust their dosage or avoid it altogether. Kidney health is so important. Okay, what else? Any other red flags? Pregnant and breastfeeding women should also avoid pyrocetin. And while the research suggests a very low potential for those drug interactions, it's always wise to talk to your doctor before starting pyrocetin, yeah. especially if you're taking other medications or supplements. Always, always good advice. It's best to get that green light from a medical professional before making any changes to your health regimen, right? Exactly. Okay, so we've explored the science. We've dug into those potential benefits, the safety considerations. It all seems pretty positive. It is. But there's another aspect we haven't even touched on yet, and it feels particularly relevant to these nootropics. And that's accessibility. That's a great point. Right. Like, it's all well and good to talk about these potential benefits, but if people can't even get their hands on this stuff, right. it's kind of a moot point. So where does Pyrocetam stand in terms of accessibility? Is it readily available to those who might benefit from it? That's where things get a little bit complicated. Pyrocetam's legal status and availability actually vary quite a bit from country to country. Oh, really? I had no idea. See, I'm so glad we're talking about this because I just kind of assumed it was available over the counter pretty much everywhere. It's not always that simple, unfortunately. In some countries, like Russia and parts of Europe, paracetamol is actually available over the counter. No prescription needed. Get it while you can. But in other places, like the U.S. and Canada, it's a bit more restricted. So how do people in those countries get their hands on pyrocetam if they want to try it? Do they have to jump through hoops? What does that look like? It depends. In the U.S., pyrocetam isn't technically FDA approved for any specific medical use. Oh, interesting. Which means legally it can't be marketed or sold as a drug. Ah, uh, okay. So it's not like you can just walk into your local pharmacy and pick up a bottle of pyrocetam. Not exactly. However, it is sometimes available often as a dietary supplement. Okay. Or a research chemical. Oh, is it always a but? Right. There's a catch. Because it's not regulated as a drug in the U.S., the quality and purity of that pyrocetam sold as a supplement. It can vary. Oh, so it's like buyer beware. 
essentially. It's super important to do your research. Make sure you're purchasing from a reputable source if you choose to go that route. Okay, so sound advice. It sounds like navigating the world of Puresetem requires a bit of a map and compass, depending on where you live. What advice would you give to our listeners who are like, okay, I'm interested, tell me more. How do I actually explore this for myself? What should they do? I always recommend starting with a trusted healthcare professional. Makes sense. They can provide guidance on the legal status of Puricetam in your specific area and whether it might be an appropriate option for you. It's like having a knowledgeable guide to navigate the often confusing world of medications and supplements, which this definitely can be. Yeah. It's great advice. And I love that we're talking about this because I think so often these conversations around, you know, brain health and cognitive function can feel very isolating. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's just you and your computer late at night doing Google searches, hoping you're not going to get scammed. Right. It can feel like the Wild West out there. It really can. So having those conversations with your doctor, with other healthcare providers. With people you trust. Exactly. It can make all the difference. Okay. So we've talked about the importance of being informed consumers, doing our research, talking to our doctors. But now I want to shift gears just a little bit because something's been on my mind this whole time that we've been talking about cognitive enhancement. Okay, I'm listening. We've talked a lot about the science of pyrocytum, how it might work, those potential benefits, its safety profile, all that good stuff. But what about the bigger picture? What about some of the societal implications of using pyrocytum and other cognitive enhancers? That's a great point. Right, because it's not just about what happens in our individual brains. It's a much bigger conversation. It really is. So what are your thoughts on that? What are some of the things we need to be thinking about as these technologies become more advanced and more accessible? Well, I think you're right to bring that up. It's a question that deserves its own dedicated discussion. But it is essential to consider these implications because as we delve deeper into understanding and potentially enhancing our very cognitive abilities, right. we're going to be encountering complex questions about fairness, equity, even the very essence of what it means to be human. Right. Like, what does it even mean to have a mind that has been enhanced in this way? What does that mean for our relationships, for our work? Exactly. For everything. For everything. And these aren't easy questions to answer. But I think, for instance, if certain individuals have access to substances that can enhance their cognitive function. Right. Giving them an advantage. While others don't, could that create inequalities or even exacerbate existing ones? Yeah. It's like we're talking about a real life limitless scenario here where those potential benefits, that enhanced brain power, it's all intertwined with these complex ethical dilemmas. Exactly. And these questions, they extend beyond just those individual uses, too. What about the potential impact on our education systems, uh -uh. the workplace, even competitive sports? Right. Like, if everyone starts taking this to get ahead at work, what does that even mean? Exactly. If cognitive enhancement becomes more commonplace, how do we ensure fairness? How do we ensure equal opportunity for everyone? It's a lot to consider. And it seems like these are questions that are going to require like a lot of thoughtful dialogue, ongoing dialogue as these technologies keep evolving. Absolutely. We need to have open and honest conversations about the potential benefits and the risks, not just from that scientific perspective, but from a societal and ethical standpoint. We need to bring in philosophers. We need to bring in ethicists. We need to bring in everyone to really think about this. It's like we're at a crossroads here where the choices that we make today about how we develop and use these technologies, they matter. They could have a profound impact on the future. It's a lot of responsibility. It is a significant responsibility. Yeah. But I also think it's an incredible opportunity. You know, to get it right. To get it right. To shape the future in a positive and equitable way. That's a great point. It's not just about avoiding potential pitfalls, but it's about harnessing these technologies for good, for the greater good. Absolutely. Just imagine a world where cognitive enhancement could be used to empower individuals with cognitive impairments. Right. Like leveling the playing field. Exactly. Yeah. To bridge those educational gaps or to foster greater understanding and empathy between people. Ooh, empathy. Now, that's something I think we could all use a little bit more of. Right. And those are just a few examples. These technologies hold transformative potential. It seems like we're really just beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible. It's both incredibly exciting, but also we do need to be careful and, and thoughtful about it, right? Absolutely. We need to proceed with both excitement and a healthy dose of caution. 
I like that. Excitement and caution. Okay, well, we've covered so much ground in this part of our deep dive on paracetam. But before we move on to part three, I want to circle back to something that you mentioned earlier, and that's paracetam's seemingly unique ability to improve that membrane fluidity. If this effect is as fundamental as it seems, could it have applications that extend far beyond what we've even talked about so far? Could this be the key to unlocking even more potential benefits? That's a fascinating question. Yeah. And it highlights the importance of thinking outside the box when it comes to drug discovery and really looking at the fundamentals. It's wild to think that pyrocetums has been around since the 60s, and it still holds so much untapped potential. It makes you wonder what other hidden gems are out there. You're absolutely right. Paracetam is a testament to the constantly evolving nature of scientific discovery. There's always something new to uncover. Here's the thing that's been bugging me, though. If paracetam is as promising as it seems, why isn't everyone talking about it? That's the million-dollar question. Mm -hmm. I think a few key factors have kept paracetam from really hitting the mainstream. One major hurdle, the lack of large-scale rigorously designed clinical trials. Yeah, that's been a recurring theme throughout this whole deep dive. Lots of promising smaller studies, but nothing really definitive. Exactly. And unfortunately, without that gold standard of evidence from robust clinical trials. It's hard to say for sure. Exactly. It's hard to get doctors to prescribe it, insurance companies to cover it. It's a tough cycle to break. It's like we need more research to prove it works, but it's hard to get the funding for that research without the proof. A classic catch-22. It's a common dilemma in drug development, unfortunately. Right. But even beyond those large-scale trials, other factors are at play here. Okay, like what? Well, there's the issue of its mechanism of action. We've discussed the membrane hypothesis. Pyrocetum as the bouncer. Right. But the truth is, we still don't fully understand all the intricate ways pyrocetam works at a molecular level. Yeah, it's complex. It is. Yeah. And that lack of a clear-cut mechanism can make some scientists and doctors hesitant. I suppose it's easier to get behind something when you know exactly how all the gears are turning. Exactly. And then there's also the matter of perception, you know, how paracetam is often categorized. What I mean? Paracetam gets lumped in with those other smart drugs or cognitive enhancers. Some of which are a bit, shall we say, questionable. Exactly. And unfortunately, that association has given Prozetatum a bit of a questionable reputation, too. People dismiss it as just another overhyped supplement. It's like it got lost in the crowd. Exactly. Even though there's this real science behind it. So how do we change that? How do we get Pyrocetam to break free from those misconceptions and get the recognition it deserves? It starts with education, for sure, both for the public and for healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. We need to share the compelling research while also acknowledging its limitations, you know. And the need for more research. It's about finding that balance. It's transparency. Love it. Okay, but even if we clear up those misconceptions, there's still the question of cost. Since Pyrocetem is off patent, it's pretty inexpensive to produce. Which is great for accessibility, of course. Right, right. But there's less financial incentive for pharmaceutical companies to invest in those big, expensive trials. Because they can't make as much money off of it, right? Right. The economics of drug development are complicated. It always comes down to money. Often, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I am optimistic that we can find ways to overcome this. Okay, good. I'm always up for some optimism. What are some potential solutions? Well, there are funding opportunities. Government agencies like the National Institutes of Health. Okay, taxpayer dollars going to good use. Exactly. And there are private foundations, philanthropic organizations that are increasingly interested in supporting this kind of research. So it's going to take a village. It might. It might take a combined effort to really push this research forward. I'm here for it. I'm fully on board the paracetam train after this deep dive. It seems like it has the potential to be a real game changer. So as we wrap up here, I'm curious, where do you see paracetam fitting into the future of medicine? We're on the brink of so many advancements, it's hard to even fathom. Artificial intelligence, gene editing, nanotechnology. It's mind-boggling. In this rapidly changing landscape, what role do you see Pyrocetam playing? Such a great question. And you're right. It really is a time of unprecedented advancements. It's impossible to predict the future with certainty. But I think Paracetam, with its unique characteristics, its range of potential applications... It just tricks up its sleeve. Exactly. I think it has what it takes to remain relevant, maybe even become increasingly vital in the years to come. Now, that's what I like to hear. Paint me a picture. What does that future look like? A future where Paracetam really shines. Imagine a future where we have more data, right? from those comprehensive clinical trials where we really understand how it works. 
Piracetum could become a cornerstone in treating age-related cognitive decline and neurodegenerative diseases. It's incredible to think that we might one day be able to not just slow down, but maybe even reverse some of those cognitive effects of aging. That would be huge for so many people. It's a bold vision, but I don't think it's entirely out of reach. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about treating what's already there. I see a role for piracetum in preventative medicine as well. Interesting. So starting early, protecting your brain before problems even arise. Exactly. Think of it like investing in your brain's future. And it goes even beyond individual health. Piracetum and other cognitive enhancers, they could play a role in shaping society itself. Okay, now we're talking. Increase productivity, creativity, empathy, understanding. A world full of understanding. Sign me up. But of course, we have to be cautious. Oh, wait. We can't forget about those ethical considerations that come with these advancements. Absolutely. We need to have those open and honest conversations about responsible use. How do we make sure these advancements benefit everyone? Everyone. Yeah. Exactly. Well, what an incredible conversation. I feel like I've learned so much about Parasitum. Me too. It's clear that this old drug as we keep calling it, right. is anything but irrelevant. In fact, it could be a key player in shaping the future of, well, everything. To our listeners, thank you so much for joining us on this incredible journey of discovery. We'll be back soon with another deep dive into the fascinating world of science and health. Until then, stay curious.